Hi, Stella. Hi, Sasha. Today's episode was very interesting. Yeah, we had Wilfred Riley on, and he's actually going to be speaking at the Genspect conference yeah. in, in a couple of weeks in November. And his talk is called The Detransition Time Bomb. Yeah. And the thing about Wilfred Riley is that he has a really wide view of things. He's yeah. coming at gender with a very much the social scientist, the political scientist, looking at the bigger picture around left wing, right wing, group politics. He's, he's coming from it from such a different perspective than we're used to, you know, psychology and things mm -hmm. like that. It's a completely different eye and it's very refreshing to look at gender in that way. Yeah, and it's interesting because we, we often talk about how there's so little detailed information about detransition in the stats, but Wilfred kind of starts, I guess it's a teaser for the Genspect, he starts explaining yeah. the way we can actually use the numbers that we do have from online surveys and Reddit communities to kind of predict and estimate what these numbers will look like, and it is going to be a time bomb. And another thing that we end up talking about today is um, the way that a kind of religious mindset of believing that there's only one true way to do things leads to extremism on both the right and the left. And we kind of give some examples yeah. of how this shows up. And it's very, very interesting. So we hope everyone will enjoy it. If you enjoy our content, don't forget to bang the, what's the word, hit, smash the subscribe button, isn't that what they say, on YouTube. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and um, yeah, anybody who is going to Denver, I can't wait to see you there. I think it's going to be very exciting. There's an yeah. amazing lineup. And Wilfred's bio is kind of funny because he wrote it himself to test whether or not Amazon <laughs> actually does check it. And indeed, it seems they don't. So I'll just read you straight from <laughs> Wilfred's mouth. Brilliant. Wilfred Riley is an associate professor of political science at Kentucky State University and the author of the books Taboo, 10 Facts You Can't Talk About, Hate Crime Hoax, and The $50 Million Question. He's currently finishing up the project Lies My Woke Teacher Told Me, as well as sketching out a book looking at transgender, gender fluid, and other kin communities, and the idea of flexible identities. Riley's published pieces in Academic Questions, Commentary, Quillette, and more than a dozen other journals and magazines, and his research interests include international relations and the prevention of war, contemporary American race relations, and the use of modern quantitative methods to test sacred cow ideas such as the existence of widespread white privilege. Off work, he enjoys dogs, archery, basketball, weightlifting, which we talk about, Asian cooking, and <laughs> beer. And Riley has described himself as the greatest <laughs> mind of a generation. So here's our conversation with Wilfred Riley. Hi, I'm Stella O'Malley, a psychotherapist in Ireland. And I'm Sasha Ayad, an adolescent therapist in the United States. Through in-depth interviews, personal stories, and psychological exploration, we probe the gender landscape within contemporary culture. And we consider the implications of prioritizing personal identity over other aspects of the self. This is the thinking person's take on gender. Join us as we look at gender from a wider lens. Well, hello there, Sasha hello. and Wilfred. I'm delighted, delighted, Wilfred, that you've come. We, were, we felt it was a real coup. When you said you'd speak for speak at our Denver conference, the Genspec Denver conference in early November. And now we're thrilled to have you on the podcast before that. So we've got a we've kind of got a prequel to the Denver conference. So you're very, very welcome. Well, thank you. Glad, glad to be here. So there's a lot of interesting things that we could talk about with you. Um, one of the things that I've been thinking about a lot is, you know, I know that in your book, Taboo, you, you outline several myths that are used often in left-wing media to really scare people about certain things that are terrifying, like police violence or just this rampant discrimination that is happening or homophobia. Um, and you are someone who uses statistics and numbers yeah. to try and understand, is this really as prevalent as the media makes it out to be? So this is very much on my mind regarding gender because we, you know, our whole podcast is about kind of warning the alarm bells around youth and gender transition for kids. And some people who advocate mm -hmm. for quote affirming care, they say that we are contributing to like a moral panic. 
and that really the numbers are very small and this is not really a big deal and they're just trying to scare people and kids are not just, you know, being, um, quote, mutilated by doctors. So it, it's interesting to have you on because you're someone who tends to look at questions like that and analyze them from a statistical lens, right? Am I getting that right so far? Yeah, that's that's almost entirely correct. The book Taboo looked at kind of the 10 most prominent stories in media and not entirely just left wing media. I mean, the final chapter critiques the alt right, uh, quote unquote, dissident right. And I look at questions like, are diverse societies rare? And the answer is no. I mean, that's been a characteristic of large civilized countries since the Roman Empire. I mean, the USA, Brazil, I mean, probably Four of the top 12 states today, India would be in the, the very diverse category in political science. But a lot of the lies, because of the pattern of control in media, where about 93 percent of national media journalists lean to the left and not. Well, anyway, we I don't need to unpack all of that. But in a particular like war mongering center left way, interestingly enough, they're not socialists or feminists or anything that might be interesting to debate. They're they're that one sort of Hillary through Bernie category. But because of that, most of the lies tended to be like from the center left. So, I mean, there was a study done by the Skeptic Research Center that I, I shout out pretty much every time I talk. <laughs> but where they asked black and urban white men how many unarmed, and I think just black men, it wasn't even men, are killed by the police every year. And the average answer was like 1,000 to 10,000. 15% of white liberals said it was 10,000 or more. Um, and the actual answer was about 11. Like if you, break the, if you break the total down, the number of unarmed black men shot in the USA by cops is 11 to 20 annually. Oh, my God. All of all males, including Native Americans, and again, of course, 98 percent of the people shot by cops are men. Sexism, I'm mm -hmm. sure but we'll get, might get into the reasons there. But I mean, like all the Native, Latino, recent immigrant, Caucasian, so on criminals thrown in, you're still under 100. So people were off by four orders of magnitude. And so I look at why this is, why this stuff is so common when it comes to fear of interracial crime. Both blacks and whites are terrified of something that kills 400 white people, 200 black people every year. And those numbers aren't even all that disproportionate. They're more white people. So I just go through the book and I compare the kind of upper middle class perception of race relations, policing, on and on with reality, with numbers that we have. Like we have the crime data. Do you, so, and do yes, you, I think that's very useful in the gender space also. And do you think you said 93% of the media, is that the US media or just the, the Western world media uh, that are 93% are left leaning? And is it because they're left leaning that they, they, they kind of sell this narrative? Or is there another reason that they're selling this narrative, if you follow me? I think, to be honest, that's just the U.S. national media. But I'm pretty sure that if you took the U.K. So media, I, given the yeah. treatment of GB News and so on, it would be identical. I, would say I mean, so. and there's something that we've just seen over the years since the 1960s really radicalized a lot of people. And then you started seeing a reactionary backlash that's just about as obnoxious to the radicalism. You've really seen people cluster in spaces. So policing in the USA is like 70 to 80 percent conservative, which is probably one reason it became an easy target. And I mean, I frankly would think that's not ideal if you have guys policing working class immigrant neighborhoods or something. But with media, we've seen the reverse where the people that want to be like, I mean, I enjoy painting, you know, but the people that want to be professional artists or that want to be media figures that want to be academics, it's just a real cloister bubble. Like a third of what you read is going to be derivative of Marx. So intelligent conservatives often go into the business world or they go into a few fields like engineering, e even philosophy to some extent where you might get some options. But in sociology, history, women's studies, unfortunately, political science, you I mean, you're really talking about 95 to five. And I, I think you'd see that pattern in France, for example, or the UK as well. I, I just can't prove that. Mm -hmm. Can I ask for for people who have read your book, Taboo, what is the the maybe biggest criticism you get? Because like for you to describe these statistical kind of disparities between like people think it's in the thousands and ten thousands range yeah. of like, let's say, unarmed black men versus the numbers are so shockingly small compared to people's perceptions. When you put that out there, what are what are people's responses who are kind of critique critiquing your book? Like, how can you really argue with that? 
Well, I mean, I, I like that question. I don't, I don't think you can. I think they're wrong. They lost the debate. <laughs> but I mean, the, the real answer probably, well, the real answer from serious uh, opponents would yeah. be you're not talking about just as many statistics on the other side. So, like, how does the right wing in the USA think that interracial crime breaks down? Oh, yeah. Uh, Donald Trump, the former president, uh, posted a statistical graphic once where it said accurately enough, like, you know, blacks responsible for 91 percent of black homicides. Um, but then it went down and it said blacks responsible for 83 percent of white homicides. And someone on 4chan or Reddit had just exchanged the black figure for the white figure. Like, whites are responsible for about 85% of white <laughs> homicides. Like, I'm positive that's what happened. So, I mean, I think that you could do just as much with the right. I mean, so, for example, uh, the COVID vaccines. They My take on this as a fairly amoral leader, bluntly, uh, although, you know, I walk in the light, but is <laughs> that a vaccine was rushed out because doing that would save yeah. millions of lives. Like, that, I think, is the Occam's razor. Like, we saw what was happening too. with seniors. Yeah. Leaders just said, OK, this kind of is some bullshit from Pfizer, which is an evil company, but it's going to work 85 percent of the time. And there's go, no go, go. way to ignore ignore this cost benefit analysis. But like many people on the right think that the vaccine is responsible for a substantial percentage of the covid deaths. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are doctors and doctors all over you know, Twitter and similar platforms. I notice I don't see this published in the journals, but claiming that the vaccine is linked to. 80,000 cases of near fatal myocarditis and so on. So yeah. I, I think that a, a serious left wing writer, um, Matt Taibbi, or even someone like mm -hmm. Ezra Klein, if he just had that statistic and didn't have to exaggerate, could just look at that and say, OK, that's complete bullshit. Like these are the myocarditis numbers that we got from the National Council of Primary Medicine. You're wrong. So mm -hmm. that, that's one critique. You're only doing the conservative side. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. C could I just say, I've heard people describe it as the death jab. And I was like, oh, sorry, the what? You know, really over the top. Yeah. <laughs> but I wouldn't have so much faith in the journals. I'd, I'd imagine it'll get it'll be easy enough to get it uh, peer reviewed, any sort of thing. I've lost so much faith in peer reviewed journals over over recent times. Did you think that gender was uh, as such a moral panic, that gender was 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 part of that? You didn't right from the beginning or what? what was your way in? Well, at the beginning, as kind of a male bro, not to stereotype myself, I thought the whole thing was just bullshit. Like, I thought of it, a lot of it was creepy men pranking. In fact, I still do. Uh, but that's that's a different meaning, story that gets into meaning more. Meaning you thought people's, like, gender identities, not, like, the worry about the kids. Like, what is the it here? I just want to clarify. Yeah, good point. Okay. When, when the gender discussion started in, like, 2014 is when I started oh, seeing Kate serious articles about, yeah. Um, I thought it was almost a joke. Like, it struck me as intuitively obvious. I mean, I, you know, I've taken basic research biology as a college student. It struck me as very obvious that humans are a sexually dimorphic species. I mean, they're, and the whole thing that Colin right now does, like, there are only two yeah. types of gay meats. I, I knew that. Like, I live in horse country. Friends of mine have invested in racehorses. It's not hard to tell yeah. which horse is the stallion. Like there's an entire reproductive system, as you guys know, at least as well as I do, built around these things. Like we're talking about different weights that men and women lift before the show. And there are many female advantages. Women are, I think, 70 points ahead on our SAT verbal boards, blah, blah, blah. But so the idea that you could just say, well, despite the fact that I'm only two thirds the size of one, I'm a man. It was, it was just bizarre to me. But I started seeing the serious arguments for um, the gender case shortly after serious. And the idea seems to be that the idea is that the norms and stereotypes associated with sex historically, especially in the pre-feminist era, constitute a kind of secondary identity that met matters more than biological sex. So, I mean, Butler famously described gender as the performativity of sex and so on. So, I mean, the idea would be, I'll actually give a personal example. Yeah. I took one of the major gender scales. I think you guys may have seen this on Twitter because it actually went fairly viral. And it was describing me as very masculine, mm -hmm. which is, of course, correct. But, I mean, through um, a series of about four questions where they asked me about, I think it was cats, gardening, <laughs> cooking, and let's say intimacy with my partner. Are you willing to do certain things? And I, I gave my actual answers. Like, I'm a cat lover. And they you, on the side of the screen, it suddenly said I was a masculine woman. 
And I ended up posting, like, this is absolutely real. I ended up posting the whole thing. It said that I was probably a man, but, like, likely non-binary. You can, like, Google Riley takes gender scale and you'll see, like, my (laughs) article about it in the Twitter. Yeah. But, I mean, it it struck me that, so my initial impression was that this was absolutely ridiculous. And when I began encountering the serious arguments for it, I understood the claim. But I thought that it was silly and also kind of offensive. Like, I don't feel less masculine because I'm willing to cook. Like, mm-hmm. you, you got to split the chores. Mm-hmm. Like, it's not, this, these aren't yeah. things that make you less male. So, for example, if I were smaller, would I be more feminine? If I were fitter, would I be more masculine? Uh, no, I, I think that having a penis, for bluntly, and a couple of other characteristics is what makes me and others uh, men, males. Mm-hmm. And there's not really a definition of man other than adult human male. So... I mean, the first reaction was just get this crap out of here. But when I began looking at the social impact of the gender movement, uh, no, I actually I don't I don't want to play to what may well be the audience here. But this is my just straight out opinion. I know I don't think that's a moral panic at all. The the percentage of people, the young Americans that identify as somehow queer is currently 21 percent. Yeah. Very similar in the UK. And when you unpack that. None of that means I am gay or I am a lesbian. In fact, lesbians seem to be vanishing in some of our states. What it means is I am somewhere on one of these spectrums. Like, I don't feel comfort with the feminine gender stereotype, so I am non-binary. I am trans pre-surgery. Like, there are eight or nine categories that break into this. You know, um, I am bisexual in college. I mean, who isn't? But like, <laughs> but now this is a much more serious category. Um, and yeah, but this is a much more serious cat. Yeah. I wasn't. But this is a much more serious category <laughs> that people are taking. <laughs> I was just about to ask no. you. So tell us there now, Wilfred. <laughs> no, about, about half my friend group, including some of the guys, was. But, yeah. um, but at any rate, like all, it, it was all of that sort of thing, like campus bisexual, um, yeah, kinky, yeah. I think was included. Seems an odd question to ask the kiddos. Um, yeah. but m- majority trans and NB. So mm-hmm. I, I don't think that that it, I don't think that worrying about this is overstated because there's a process, a pipeline for medicalization for these conditions. So if being NB were just the equivalent of being goth, which to some extent it right. is, right. but people, People felt like rebels in college. They refused to be conventional males or females. I mean, to some extent, that's almost good. Mm -hmm. But the issue is that now, if you dress like David Bowie, there's someone who might advise you to cut your dick off. Like, there's a really medicalized process of treatment there where you're supposed to affirm every step. So not only does that take the rebellion away, there are real consequences. So... I mean, like puberty blockers and all that are very hardcore drugs that are used to chemically castrate rapists and other sex offenders. It, we have no idea, at least from any of the 15, 20 papers I've read, what the effects of that will be long term on a child's body. You can start these at about age nine. Um, so uh, kind of last sentence. I'm prone to lengthy rambling. But I, I think <laughs> that's that why you're I here. Think they're all, uh, great. Great. It's ideal. <laughs> So I love podcasts. <laughs> talk shit with someone else for two hours. But, um, but in all seriousness, um, I think that there's obviously a very large underground of people that have been affected by this. And the feeling that I have is the same feeling that I had before I wrote one of my books. I hate crime oh, yeah. hoax. Mm-hmm. Where people were saying, well, there are almost no uh, false accusations of hate violence or anything like this. You know, the, the number is 37 per year. And I looked at that and that required a very formal process of contacting the FBI and telling them that your entire police department had screwed up. So I actually just went through the press and I looked at how many major stories of criminal level hate violence had collapsed. You know, ranging from Jussie Smollett through Duke Lacrosse a bit, bit in the past, but Air Force Academy where a general went to campus to speak out against racism turned out it was all made up. Kansas State, the tagging of the luxury cars, you know, Wisconsin Parkside, there were nooses on the campus, so on down the line. And by the time I was done just prepping for the book, I had a list of about 500 of these concentrated within a couple of years. And yeah. no one's saying it's the majority, but there are less than 7,000 hate crimes in a typical year. And very few of them get the coverage that I would have needed to put them in the data set. So same thing with detransition. Mm. One Reddit page has 50,000 people on it. It's coming. 
Yeah. Can I can I just ask one is uh, tell tell our listeners about the nooses on the campus because that was Oh, so I was just going to ask Wilfred that. That's the most sh- amazing story. Yes, do tell it. Well, the, there've been about 50 of those stories and they're all, they're almost always fake. I mean, the Wisconsin Parkside story. I actually applied for an academic job at Wisconsin Parkside, you know, 10 years ago or something like that, 8 years ago. It's a very pleasant place in the Chicago's nearly as big as New York. If you look at the Metroplex, it's like 10 million versus 16 million or something. So it goes into Wisconsin where it, it just short of meets the Milwaukee Metroplex, like four or five million people. One of my uh, pet peeves is that people sleep on the Great Lakes region of the United States, but that, that's another topic. But Wisconsin Parkside is the furthest north outpost of the Chicago train lines, the Metro. And uh, I went up there and did a job talk once, but a very pleasant sort of leafy little campus. And someone across the campus was apparently committing this series of like near atrocity level racial offenses. So first, there were a series of notes found on campus with the names of something like 15 black student leaders written on them with lines drawn through them, like marked for death. This happened. There were a couple of nooses found on the campus. I think one on the ground, which may just have been a rope. But one hanging from a tree, Uh, this went on and on. Police began to investigate, took it extremely seriously, as they do with most of these sort of cases, at least if there's a white perp. And it turned out that the person actually responsible was a black student leader. The way she was identified was that someone went through the police detective, went through the list of names of people that were allegedly targeted. And these were mostly very ethnic uh, African-American names. And found that only one of them was spelled correctly. And that gave them a clue oh, about gosh. who the offender was. So they they set her down and she sort of broke. But that's really typical with these campus news stories. I mean, most aren't even at that level of interest. A lot of them are just ropes. Yeah. So, I mean, like, there was, there the was a rope. The were just a rope. Yeah. Yeah. In, in at least 10 stories in my data set, the noose, and someone had to criminally report the noose for me to include it. But the noose was just like a rope hanging from a crane at a construction site. And that was that was the news story. And students were and there really is a point here, just as there is with both men and women online accusing one another of abuse for things like asking for food. I mean, it's this students had been really attuned to the idea that there was racism everywhere. But in fact, if you're a black student at a liberal arts small college in Ohio. I'm thinking of Oberlin, where this happened three or four times. There's almost no racism. I mean, you're in Why the Yankee North. Why did she do it? Why did this woman do it? Do they well, know? The reason that most of them did it was to kind of get attention. We've oh. clearly given a sort of premium to victimization. It, and this has effects that you, you see across the board. A, a friend of mine, for example, was on Tinder, the dating and hookup app recently. And one of his comments in passing was, there aren't any white women on the app. And, you know, I'm not a big Tinder user, but it was like, what do you mean? I mean, there are hundreds of them. And he was like, no, all of them identify themselves as something else because it's mm-hmm. considered a bit de classe just to be a well-adjusted, mm-hmm. you know, upper middle class, white or Jewish woman. I mean, like you're mm-hmm. so everyone describes themselves mm-hmm. as some sort of kink or a person of size or you open with your politics or you're like neurodivergent. And he mm-hmm. went he went through like the whole sort of thing. Like you can put all four of these in your bio and about half of the women do. Uh-huh. So. In in this environment, I, I think that people are often very keenly attuned for instances of, in particular, race prejudice, where, in my opinion, almost none of them are real and open. Yeah, I mean, I'm the, sure there was no. a, there was a story you said about a, a bunch of bananas was left on a stoop and that was mis misinterpreted. What was that? Yeah, that, that was one of the, the hate crime hoaxes. I think it was a black, I don't, I don't have the full data set in front of me, but I think it was, although I guess I just have to pull it up on this exact oh, computer. No, no, but I'm a lazy person. Any, but <laughs> anywho, like a bunch of, a bunch of fruit was found on a stoop and the claim was, well, that must be targeting the group there. I think it was a black sorority. And it became this whole thing. Like, how dare they call the beautiful ladies of, you know, Zeta Phi Beta or whatever, a bunch of monkeys. And it turned out that that it was literally just fruit. It had been left there by someone who'd been out for a snack or something like this. There was another case with uh, dog feces. A blind woman was walking her service dog, and she had been instructed, because she was well-loved on campus, if the dog shits, if the dog does what dogs do, 
you can take that, you can put it in a bag, and we don't want you wandering around for a half an hour looking for trash cans because mm-hmm. you're blind. Um, just put that on the doorstep of any building, and we assume the janitorial staff there, just the guys in the building, will be glad to throw that away once. And so this person did that. She put a bag of dog feces on a building stoop. It turned out there were a lot of black students in the building, and they thought that this was an intentional attack. Um, an attempt to drive them off the campus. And this became a national story, like feces found in the black student lounge. Right. And even leaving aside why anyone would care about some college prank, no, it turned out to be this lovable blind woman. Who was traumatized by this, by the way? Like, she apparently received, like, attacks. People were telling her that she had done it intentionally. And she just kept saying, I'm blind. Oh, no, there's nothing... Gosh. It became very, very I'm disturbing. literally race blind because I can't see. The thing that I, I, I would really <laughs> like you to talk about would be the, like I, I said earlier, is the kind of the, the detransition time bomb is the name of your talk mm-hmm. in Denver. And that's kind of moving into a more serious kind of field, yes. which is actually you are one of the very few people who can speak about the numbers, who can speak about stats in an authoritative way. And I'd love you. I'd love to to hear what you've got to say about detransition and about numbers on any level, because we have so few reliable stats around detrans. It's it's frighteningly difficult to speak about knowledgeably as a result. Well, yeah. So first of all, I, I would like to shout out some of the people that have done some writing about this that just haven't published it yet. I mean, I know Christina Buttons has. Oh, yeah. uh, Colin Wright probably worked on that paper a bit. I know Corey Clark is looking at uh, at some I, of that. So I, I mean, can I just jump in? Christina Buttons is yeah. going to be showing her poster of her survey at Denver, so she will right. get a yeah, yeah, and hopefully she'll get a chance to speak about it because it. I think it's a great piece of work. Yeah, well, she's kind of doing. I, we actually are probably going to co-write an academic paper uh, mm-hmm. and see if we can get that. Uh, probably along with Khaled is one of the authors. Um, it's. Lydia Littman, I believe, was the person Lisa who did Littman. the rapid. Lisa, Lisa, Lisa Littman. Littman. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, sorry, the person who did the rapid onset uh, gender dysphoria research. I know Christina's reached Lisa out to. Littman. Yeah, just because the idea is obviously she might want to look at this or even be involved with the project. She's the first person to really do Brilliant. work along these lines. So some of this has been done, but it all it, it's kind of what I would do is along the same lines of projects people have proposed. It's just I or the group of us with Christina actually initiating the idea would do it on a larger scale. So, I mean, like, I do think you can figure out how many detransitioners there are. And this, again, is like the hate crime hoax uh, example. There are massive public forums full of people that require you to identify publicly as a detransitioner before you can join. And they have, you know, X number of members. So R slash Dtrans right now, I might be off by a bit, but I think is at 49,000. Yeah. And that's entirely people who said they've had a negative experience with either puberty blockers, um, something beyond that, like hormones or actual surgery. So, but I mean, some, some of the members on that, tra- that, that particular Dtrans Reddit are just, let's say, journalists or, or people who are just interested. But I hear you. I've been following that since 2019 and there was less than a thousand. And the well, moderators, that, yeah, the moderators say that there is a there is a significant uh, fraction is is definitely the detransitioners. Well, it's actually you can measure that though, which is one of the things that we'd we'd be interested in doing. I mean, so if the site admins agree, and it looks like they're going to, you could just survey Brilliant. the site. I mean, you could put a pin post at the top of the site and ask people to anonymously describe their experiences. The site actually did this, but. I don't think did it in like the classic post IRB fashion, but I mean, they just asked people like, if you're willing to take this survey, describe what your background is. Are you a detransitioner? Are you an ally? And about 70% of the people on the site were just detransitioners. And that doesn't surprise me at all. I mean, in the sense that if you look at the, in the hate context, again, if you look at the major racial incidents in the press, uh, Covington Catholic comes to mind, uh, the Jacob Blake shooting, so on down the line, things that are described as acts of abusive racism, almost none of them actually turn out to be. So the idea that there are no such cases seems inherently pretty dubious. Like in the Jacob Blake situation, the guy was a rapist who went back to his victim's house and fought the cops for three minutes before someone shot him. And he didn't die. 
Like there was a very intentional attempt to make these seem as sympathetic as possible. But in reality, none of them were, many of them were not real. The detransition, I mean, my own expectation would be that a professional survey would show that about 70%, once again, of the people on the major detrans forms, there are three or four of them, are in fact detransitioning from something. They're mm-hmm. coming back from at minimum very intense social transition that might have affected romantic and sexual relationships, but probably puberty blockers, hormones. All you have to do to get hormones in any city I've lived in is go to Planned Parenthood. Yeah. I mean, so it's it's not a complex thing to do. And I would imagine that many rebellious kids have done it. I think if you're over 15, you, you just need to bring yourself. You sign okay. your own statement of, you know, authentic gender experience or whatever. So I'm going to talk about essentially when at the conference, I'm going to break down those sort of raw numbers, like all told there are 105,000 people or something. But then talk about the surveys that have been done. Are these people real? And why it's reasonable to think so. Yeah. Um if you look at the number of, I think Colin Wright, again, uh, was the person that obtained this figure. But if you look at the number of people that have gotten full-on top and bottom surgeries before they're 18, it's over 1,500. As I recall, it's mm-hmm. considerably over 1,500. But that that is a baseline figure. Seems like a reasonable estimate of the percentage of 100,000 or whatever people that have gone to that that next step. Again, these numbers are all estimates, but you're not talking about a pool of 10 or something no, like that. It's no. in the tens of thousands. We hope you're enjoying this conversation as much as we are. We just wanted to take a quick moment and say thank you to all of our listeners. Your support is the fuel that keeps this train running. So please be sure to like and subscribe on YouTube or your favorite podcast platforms. And do be sure to check out the conversations that are happening on YouTube in the comments section. We think that we have some of the smartest, most engaged viewers out there, and we really appreciate all of the interactions. Also, we produce additional bonus content every week for our listener community on Patreon. Go to widerlenspod.com and click on join our listener community. Your financial support means a lot to us. And for those of you who are in need of parenting support and resources, we each have parent coaching membership groups. So please do check those out. You can find links to both of them at widerlenspod.com or in the show notes. And of course, you can buy our book, When Kids Say They're Trans, out now in the UK and coming out very soon in the US. Thank you so much. Now back to the show. Yeah, one of the things that's really interesting and weird about this whole world is that because it's, I mean, A, it's so politically contentious, but B, there are really ardent activists who get involved with the gender world. And like, for example, Dr. Littman, when she was publishing her detransition study, which had 100 participants, she had to go kind of through two iterations of the process because the first one she put out was basically sabotaged by a bunch of activists who wanted to go in there and kind of fudge with her data by filling it out as kind of like fake people. So, you Mm -hmm. know, it's so hard to... um, to just even try and collect information about this. And we know that Dr. Bailey and um, a, a co-author, a parent, tried to publish a huge survey yeah. about rapid onset gender dysphoria with like more than a thousand participants. Mm-hmm. And the activists went after them and the journal, I think, ended up redacting the paper. Stella yep. and I talked to him about that. So it's just such a weird world. And, and it's it's weird that trying to collect this information becomes... I mean, I know you're saying that there are ways to get this information, which is great. Mm-hmm. And also, this is so much more messy than I think a lot of other questions that people study in social science and, and just to add, Yeah, just to add to Sasha's point, there's an extraordinary culture within the medical world that isn't in the aviation world and isn't in any other world, <laughs> where <laughs> if a mistake is made in the medical world, they just roll over it in general. And that, you know, arguably that's the culture in which detransition is is being hid. While like if you look at black box thinking and all that, that's considered a great way to kind of approach any issue. Like you look at what's gone wrong and you Mm. discover everything that you know about it so that you can know better. So it's it's amazing that the medical world, I think there's a culture that we're we're up against here that uh that needs to be examined, but it's a it's a certainly a part of it. But sorry, I jumped in on Sasha's point. Not like me. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, yeah, so are, are both of you guys done with the points, by the way? Yeah, yeah, yeah. finally. Oh, okay, Seven. okay, cool. Yeah, so, but yeah, I, I think there are a couple different things there. And so, like, 
Lisa Littman actually jumped. I was only on the end of this call. I think I confused her with uh, Lydia Leiterman earlier, by the way. Oh, yeah. Okay. Another cool person, but un- yeah. unrelated to this Ooh, particular okay. academic space. Okay, but got it. I was, in, I was on the end of a call with uh, Dr. Littman where she was talking about this. And the, the stuff struck me as, again, insane. Yeah. Uh, that her study, th- I, I understand this could be a problem where if you post a survey online using the standard survey monkey links or something like that, people could just spam it a la being brigaded on Twitter. You know, there's a poll going on on Twitter right now that asks whether women and men should have the right to vote. And it was attacked first by men's rights activists who said that women shouldn't have the right to vote. And now feminists have apparently discovered it and are saying that men shouldn't have the right to vote. Oh, so right now, no one has the right to vote. <laughs> it's complete worseless horseshit. It's well, like 12% of N- NPs por- do. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's right. Everyone's just non-binary. That's the end game. But I mean, so like there's a lot of stuff. Uh, the, the 78 different genders, like I'm demi-romantic. Um Meaning that I'm male, but I mean the what's what's the other one? Demisexual. Demisexual but at any rate, yeah. the the point of that though is like you can see that kind of brigading online. You rarely see it with academic studies. Like it would be considered extremely bizarre if someone posted a study about your experiences with racism to have black activists spam it by just clicking the number ten. So the gender space is one of the few situations where I've ever seen that. Mm. And yeah, she was describing that in some detail. That was. That was bizarre. There are ways to get around that, though. I mean, just you, like, yeah. I could probably, or certainly any IT pro that we put on the team could just look at the IP address that each uh, link okay. is coming from. Are you trying to vote a hundred times? Like, I can't imagine that there are not, it, can you block certain addresses that are associated with activist groups like the Human Rights Campaign? Like, I, this is to some extent spitballing, but obviously there are ways you could do this. You have to click through and do a rudimentary identification of yourself before you can vote with yeah. the promise that we would destroy that once the survey was done. But yeah, I mean, it's definitely true that for things that contradict like crazy left-wing dogma, it's harder to do the studies and there are more attacks on them. And this this isn't novel entirely to the gender space. Like a casual friend of mine is Bruce, or acquaintance of mine is Bruce Gilley from Portland State, good guy. And he wrote a paper called The Case for Colonialism, where he he's also a master of the subtle, non-provocative title. <laughs> but the argument was that if you look at countries that were colonized by civilized countries like Britain, not Spain in the 1500s when we were all still working out, you know, how to use metal weapons and all that. But like England from 1800 on, it's irrevocably true that they have better outcomes than countries that weren't. So, I mean, he compares former British possessions like Ghana and India to most of the rest of the world, equal peers like Ethiopia. So the point of the paper, which you can agree or disagree with, I mostly agree with it. uh, However, proved so controversial that the journal that he published it in, Third World Quarterly, started getting death threats. Uh, Nationalists from India were calling them and saying they were going to attack the building with bombs and this kind of thing. Uh, The editor in chief, I believe, was told that his wife would be kidnapped. So they actually contacted Bruce Gilley and said, you know, for God's sake, can we take this down? Mm -hmm. And he said, "Okay, as long as I get to publish it somewhere else. So it's published in academic questions. Mm -hmm. But that sort of thing almost never happens in reverse and is generally used to block legitimate knowledge. Like in the trans space, any study of autogatophilia will will draw this kind of reaction where people will will say, you know, are you saying that I'm not a woman? I'm just a pervert. No, you're destroying my entire identity. And those papers almost never make it through the final stage of review. Um, there's not much you can do about that. I do think that the the idea of new journals, like myself, uh, Lee Jussum, Corey Clark, who I mentioned, a bunch of other people that are fairly serious, right? The editorial mm-hmm. board of a new journal, the abbreviation's JOIBS, but it's the, sort of the journal of open research in the behavioral sciences. Whoa. And I mean, yeah, so like if if a paper is obviously good, because we're all good methodologists, Mm -hmm. but has been rejected for foolish reasons, like we'll publish it. So when you do that, there's almost an element of capitalism. Like you can pretty rapidly become like the number two or three or whatever journal, one journal in the field because you don't have the same barriers everyone does. Yeah, it's the question there is how you. Swift Press in, in the UK seem to be owning the field with books at the moment because mm-hmm. they're willing to they're willing to, you know, publish books that need to be published. If anybody like yourself, Wilfred, people realize that there's a huge demand for this. If you can just withstand attacks from extremists, which is no small change. 
Yeah, I, I remember the old Fox News patriarch, Rupert Murdoch, once gave a speech. And, you know, he said some things that I agreed with, some things that I didn't. But it was it was funny. It was exactly what you'd expect it to be. He had, he had a bourbon mm-hmm. in his hand. And he was asked, what made you think of Fox? And he said, well, the USA is a center-right country, if you look at our demographics. So I looked at the media market, and I realized that 60% of it, it wasn't being served. Like, I'm not some bleeping genius. I just, I realized that. And so I started hiring people like Bill O'Reilly and Britt Hume, who were, um, what is it, before Laura Ingram? Uh, I don't know. I don't, I don't know their entire staff. But like people that were legendary, you know, news readers mm-hmm. and putting them on the air. And I was rapidly the number one network. So when you look at religious philosophies, and I would put the extremes of wokeism right up there with any of the major faiths, you see people refusing to do things that are in their own self-interest. Because they think they're contrary to God. So why why wouldn't you publish the best articles in the field of psychology as a psych journal? Because that's not cricket. It's bad karma. It's not done. And it's Mm -hmm. the same thing with why Fox and GB News and so on are doing well. Why wouldn't other networks platform Greg Gutfeld, for example, just many of the people I have are perfectly normal taxpayers. Because you can't. That can't be done. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, it, with that attitude, you finish second, but you finish in the graces of God, according to you. Yeah, it's like a fire and brim, brimstone version of religion. And they're they're afraid of things like harm and, you know, toxic yes. oppression. And, like, those kinds of things have kind of become... And, and it's actually something I wanted to, to go back to because I was thinking about all of those, you know, hoaxes. And I think it's... The surface story is like, oh, these are ridiculous examples of people who maybe are attention seeking or they're really like believers. They're zealots. Right. And they they kind of fabricate this whole scenario. But I think, you know, something that I'm really interested in is how does that impact the people that they purport to serve? Because I just think walking around with that level of paranoia and fear and suspicion of others um, and, you know, I've, I've met people who I think have gone down that road and it really destroys your ability to walk through the world in, a, in an open way. Like, I think some suspicion of the world is valuable, but if you really walk around the world thinking that if this person is a different race, like they are going to have all these secret hidden, like evil agendas and that they're going to judge me, like, what does that do to people and you think that college students are really buying into this. And it makes me wonder, like, what does that mean for the next generation of, you know, black and brown, quote, people? I hate that term anyway, because I'm like, there are so many differences between myself as an Egyptian versus you versus like someone from India. Like, we're not all the same. Yeah. So I hate that. But what is that doing to everybody's psychology to make them so paranoid? Like, what, what are your thoughts on that? It really bothers me. I, I, first of all, I agree. That's, that's ext- extremely well put. Yeah, it bothers me too. I think, but I, so one thing I would say, I don't think this is all that different from traditional religion. So right now on the right, which is where I mostly dwell, there's been kind of a <laughs> renaissance of support for what's called the trad movement. Mm-hmm. And you hear people talking about things like banning gay marriage once again, or banning all pornography and erotica. Um, the repeal the 19th argument about women not voting online, I don't think is entirely sardonic. Yeah. So, I mean, the traditional, very religious, very conservative model contains a lot of this same thing. Um, and this is very different from my attitudes about crime and migration and taxes and so on. I've, I've always found this kind of nuts. But I mean, so if you walk around thinking that everyone is going to go to hell if they don't follow a certain path of religious praxis, and that many of these people are going to attempt to do normal things like offer business deals or dates and potential sexuality Mm -hmm. to corrupt you and send you down that path. Like you're probably just as paranoid. Mm -hmm. I mean, many of the people I've met that are intensely Catholic, Orthodox, Jewish, so on down the line are great guys, but have a lot of this same thing. Like I have to spend X amount of time every day resisting the devil's temptations. So I, I think there might be a personality type that, in fact, I know there is a personality type that's associated with like intense, crazy, over the top belief. Mm. And I've never thought there's a, any particular reason that that belief would have to be religious in nature. That's such a good point. I mean, what is the personality type? Is it based on Big Five? Like, break down the, the characteristics if you remember it off the top of your head. Yeah, I'm, I'm more a political scientist than a psychologist. Okay. In fact, I'm not a psychologist at all, so I'm just sort of bullshitting on the internet. But I'm a really smart guy. So, I mean, actually, <laughs> the, there's a... The smartest! You're the best mind according, in the... <laughs> 
According to me, yeah. I was that actually was just a joke that I like Amazon, if you're an author and you've sold more than a few copies, has this whole thing like we monitor very closely what's said on this site. And I personally think that big data is extremely stupid. So I just I started saying ridiculous things in my author profiles like I was the greatest thinker in the world to see if anyone read through them at all, and nobody ever did. So it's it's all still up there. But at any rate, um, if I really had to look at kind of the authoritarian personality type, I do, or the the follower personality type, the pack member type. Yeah. Um, I think there are a lot of traits like an extremely strong sense of loyalty, uh, kind of narcissism, but suborned to a higher cause. Uh, like there are a whole bunch of things that make people even incredibly intense patriots. Like I like America and fight in war if the country was invaded, but I don't automatically believe I'm say better than a Greek or a Frenchman or Brazilian or something like that. So there, there's a specific personality type that we do in fact look at in political science. And the interesting thing is that because the social science disciplines lean so far left for years, the assumption has been that PAC member authoritarians would be on the right. And this goes back to Theodore Adorno's The Authoritarian Personality. Okay. Where there's this whole like they describe a person who is very loyal, above average in aggression, above average in narcissism, just like there is a type. Yeah. And they say, well, this person is found on the right. But mm. recently, like it no, yeah, that that's right. Like you guys have probably mm-hmm. read some of this. Like at Emory in Atlanta, they just started giving the survey to people yeah. without looking at politics. And they also flipped the questions politically. So, for example, someone who's on the left would be asked if they thought it was necessary to restrain traditional religious people or anti-maskers or something like that. Yeah. And what they found, as I recall, is that authoritarianism is slightly more common on the left. Um, but it, it's there, there's no reason for conservatives to gloat. It's, just, it's very dispersed in the population. There are many people that think that they've been told the one true way. And anyone who's screwing with the one true way is literally yeah. preventing utopia. You're blocking yeah. the caliphate. I thought- so you you must eliminate them. And this is this is what uh, so many people believe. I mean, this is this is what communists believe. Real yeah. communism has never been tried. This is what the most devout yeah. Christians and Muslims believe. This is very yeah. definitely what yes. wokists believe. Yes. Like if the devil of racism and maybe sexism and classism, although they hardly ever talk about that in reality. <laughs> but if these devils were removed, people would be perfect. Yes. They do. Why do... Why do men like smart women and women like dominant men? The patriarchy. You know, why do black people feel like everything is attributed to some outside demonic force that they don't like? The whole idea of power dynamics, like you have a boss, then you're oppressed. I mean, what that essentially says is that the entire system of human interactions, I mean, in in almost every relationship, one partner has slightly more control over the finances. You know, um, how often does your boss email you? Is your teacher allowed to grade you fairly? Everything that humans do, no matter how healthy, is evil. So Mm -hmm. we must eliminate the force of power. The demon Mm -hmm. for them would be power or privilege, maybe, in order to make the world perfect. And I think power needs to be regulated, but that's an insane idea because it's Mm -hmm. a religious idea. Mm -hmm. I thought it was a a, a specific trait of the left was that they, they value the collective over the individual and therefore... They value the authoritarian impulse because, it, and you know, I I believe we saw it in full force in COVID, where you were told to stay inside oh, yeah. to save lives and things like that. Everybody was there's a gleefulness, uh, authoritarian kind of impulse that seems to have gone. It, it's it's unbridled now because they feel that they're on the side of right as such. Yeah, <laughs> but it's side. interesting because I re- I read Thomas Sowell finally after a long time, The Conflict of Visions, and having that framework of like the constrained vision and the unconstrained vision was really interesting because I see what you're saying, Stella, about the collectivism. But in a way, that's also this kind of traditionally conservative value of like the military and like all of these big organizations. That's a kind of collective force. And it, it seems like throughout time, the left and the right almost flip flop, like the free love 60s mm-hmm. was very individualistic. It wasn't collectivist at all, really. So it's weird how over time when different issues come into prominence, the, the roles get switched in a weird way. That, that's actually a legitimately interesting point I hadn't thought of. I mean, my my description of it would probably just be that there are good and bad people on the left and the right. I mean, imagine. But if, if, we view, if we view authoritarianism as bad, like you want to be a dictatorial leader, then there are going to be people on the right who are sort of, you know, 
gun and altar and good book in the woods, free thinkers. And yeah. there are going to be people on the left who are, you know, make out in a field and then go home and paint a beautiful picture, free thinkers. And yeah. both of those groups need to be regulated at the margins. You know what? You know, what's the guy doing with the gun? Is, can people see the field? But I mean, those people are probably a good thing for the world. Then there are other people who would argue that anyone who wants to in any way limit your gun use or, you know, field play should be incarcerated and reeducated. And it's fair to describe those people as bad. So I, I, I think that the in reality, very often there are things that track across both blacks and whites, men and women, left and right, um, like a penchant for what used to be called evil that are, in fact, far more socially destructive than the groups themselves. And a lot of conversations between groups that don't recognize this become nonproductive. So last sentence, but one of the big things on Twitter and these kind of platforms is like, well, your race is worse. And I, I've just started to mute all this shit. But it's like, you know, here's a video of a black guy committing a crime. OK, well, here's a video of a white guy committing a corporate crime. Now, here's a Mexican guy walking across the border. Now, here's an Arab guy with a bomb. And like every group, except sometimes East Asians, can be targeted in this way. We've all seen it. And we've all seen the threads where all these <laughs> SOBs are arguing like, no, you're worse. Um, It seems to me that the problem there would be something like crime. Yeah. Like, I mean, you can say that the black or southern white crime rate is higher right now. But a very small percentage of people in all these groups are criminals. The yeah. percentage of uh, people of Arabic descent, they're Islamic terrorists, is like, Point oh 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 one two or something like that. So it would make more sense to lock up criminals and terrorists or simply kill them than it would to criticize the entire group that has Vice X as a bunch of terrorists or something like that. So, yeah, I would I would agree that there are good and bad conservatives and liberals. But, but the authoritarianism yeah. is probably equal across both. We'd like to jump in here really quick and offer up a thank you to Genspect, one of our sponsors. Genspect is an international organization that offers a healthy approach to sex and gender, and they're hosting the Bigger Picture Conference in Denver, Colorado this November. Be sure to listen to our episode number 134 to hear about all the amazing speakers lined up and visit genspect.org to order tickets. And if you can't make it in person, online tickets are available. We'd also like to give a shout out to GETA, Gender Exploratory Therapy Association. If you're looking for a therapist for yourself or your child, check out the GETA directory. And if you're a clinician who is questioning the affirmation model and you're looking for resources and community, please consider joining GETA today. Visit genderexploratory.com to learn more. Isn't it very strange? Um, it continuously boggles my mind. You might be able to give me insight here. How did pr the pro-medical big pharma let's medicalize and make an awful lot of money out of children and other people who want to transition, older people. How did that become a left-wing issue rather than a right-wing issue? Well, it, it, it just so counterintuitive. If you had told me that 20 years ago, I would have explained in detail why that was never going to happen mm. to the left. <laughs> you know? Yeah, well, like a, a former riot girl, like Buddy, an ex-partner of mine, actually got the online tattoo that says Pfizer girl. It actually says Pfizer, bitch. But that was that was during COVID where people were like advocating for vaccination. I'm not, not going to name the person still cool, but like just, you know, there is an element of like like Noam Chomsky recently came out against misinformation, like on Twitter using like a thousand dollar camera, like ten thousand dollar camera. And it's just sort of like, do you guys see what you're doing? Like, do yeah. you really think that Pfizer or Facebook is an ally of the punk rock movement or something? But I mean... I actually think, again, yeah. this gets back to the idea of movements as being defined by core ideas and often silly ones rather than by groups of people. Oh. So we've often thought of the left in the West as being the working class movement. Um, in fact, I support a lot of things that the working class left wing movement backs, like better health care. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of my friends actually fought with Occupy in Chicago. Now, they're all like investment bankers now. It's 12 <laughs> years later, like we lost. You know, you got to go get a job. But I mean, uh, it, it always struck me that what broke Occupy was the ruling clade disuniting the working class. That's when all the racial crap started and so on. But 
at any rate, I think that that might not be entirely accurate. The left is the working class movement. The left has been a movement around a set of ideas from changing yeah. attitudes towards sex to yeah. a more communist American enterprise, British enterprise, so on for hundreds of years. It just happened that those appealed more often in the past to sort of wild and underpaid working class people. Now, um, that's not necessarily the case. You're seeing people that were former hippies and so on that still have free love attitudes or that would favor a more socialized healthcare system that are very well off. So, I mean, I, I don't think that there's an inherent group that supports these ideas. I, I think the ideas themselves are the bases of the movements. So, for example, I would suspect you'll see a lot of black businessmen moving hard to the right mm -hmm. as the impact of illegal immigration and so on uh, okay. kicks in over the next 10 years, something like that. So, again, there. Yeah, movements are defined by ideas, and people who take ideas too seriously past the point of wanting to restrain the freedom of others are usually bad. Yeah, I mean, I tend to talk a lot about this in regards to radicalization and indoctrination. And when you take any kind of idea that often has a nugget of truth within it, like it's relatable on some level, whether it's like an extreme right position or extreme left position, there's always a nugget of truth there. But then you kind of blur the boundaries of... Um, you know, the way things are relative and how context matters and you, you get these hard positions like, fuck that, context never matters, like this is a human rights violation. <laughs> and then you all of a sudden you lose the ability to actually discern if you've fallen off a cliff. And I think this can happen in, in any belief system. It's, it's, it's interesting. Um, well, well, I you kind of just defined mm. faith, right? Like no matter, yeah. like the old yeah. line from like yeah. St. Augustine, no yeah. matter what the risk is, yeah. I go forward with God. Yeah. You know, they, they, they conquered a lot of the world under those banners, like, yeah. you know, yeah. Ve Victus Dies Levolt. Yeah. Although Dies Levolt, Ve Victus is actually a great slogan for competition. But I mean, like the basic, the basic ideas though were very often wrong and people just blindly believed them. And I think people today are going to blindly believe incorrect ideas until their minds are changed. Yeah, and I mean, in the current kind of thing that we're talking about here, there there is a feeling that maybe ties in with Stella's medical comment of like understanding the complaints or the gripes of the, you know, oppressed person in question. So in the medical context, that might be like patient driven care, right? So oh, if yeah. a patient identifies with their depression and they love their Prozac, it doesn't matter if the producer of that drug is some multi-billion dollar corporation that will do anything to make, you know, make profits. It's the patient's lived experience, quote unquote. So there's all these weird things with consumerism and, you know, listen to the children, listen to the women, listen to the patients. You know, you, you can't tell me what my mental health diagnosis is. Even in the online space, there are people who declare like, I don't need a diagnosis to be autistic. I, I just say I am and therefore I am. So I, I know you've looked a little bit at some of the online stuff. Where do you think that may fit into the picture? Because it feels like the, the social media and Internet era has yeah. changed what we tend to think about as the way people kind of think about like big pharma and things like that. Yeah. I, so there, there's a there's a lot there, like in terms of attitudes toward big pharma and so on. I, I do think a lot of that just reflects the financial shifts within the left and the right. I mean, as in the USA, rural Caucasians become more of a population minority and as incomes decrease because we something that's never discussed by the left and the right is that in America, we ship like 40 percent of our jobs to Malaysia. Yeah. I mean, this was NAFTA was occurred in 1994. It was followed by the ASEAN trade deal. So when people when people ask about things, there's often a tendency to have these sort of silly moral debates rather than to look at and you guys aren't doing that. But rather than looking mm -hmm. at root mm -hmm. causes, like mm -hmm. why? Why do people have fewer jobs? Well, because we sent all our fucking jobs to another country. You know, I mean, that that's yeah. that's the root cause. Like, why are fertility rates declining? There's this whole man versus woman thing. People are shouting about it. It's feminism. No, it's pornography. No, it's birth control. <laughs> like, you can now choose not to have kids. Uh -huh. And no, almost no upper class, upper middle class men or women want to have kids until they're about 30, mm -hmm. which is when marriage starts. Now, there actually are things you could do about that from family leave on the left to marriage subsidies mm -hmm. on the right. You know, they're, they're real solutions. But the basic idea of like, no, you guys are playing too many video games. That's not really the problem. I mean, so 
I, I think you're seeing very practical reasons for the uh, the shift in attitudes among the left and the right. Like if poor minorities are more likely to vote for the left, if we are going to group it and more whites are becoming poor minority group members, I mean, you'll see an attitudinal shift. Um, that's actually something we should research more in political science. Uh, in general, academics don't care about poor white people at all. Mm. I mean, it's just that that's why like Hillbilly Elegy was such a huge hit. I mean, this guy mm. pointed out, well, there are the exact same problems, except maybe murder rate that are associated with black slums, a fatherlessness, you know, yeah. drug use, alcoholism, DUI, suicide. They're exactly the same. Like he has, he has charts of the levels in these poor white communities. Why does no one ever come to Ohio with a positive message? It's a good book. Whatever you think of his political life since then. But like to answer the very specific question, does the internet contribute to this? Like, yeah. And I mean, I mentioned in passing like this debate over gaming and porn and so on. Mm -hmm. I think that stuff, frankly, I mean, obviously you shouldn't spend all day doing it or smoking weed, but that stuff has very little measurable impact on a lot of the dynamics we see. What does, what does affect isolation and so on is the ability to create your own online world and spend five or six hours a day in it. Yeah. Um, I frequently Sorry. ask my students these sort of questions like, do you follow anyone who's a Republican on Instagram? Mm. Like just in, I mean, these are, you know, black and Appalachian kids in their early twenties, a pretty interesting group, but like the answer is always no. It's yeah. just this bubble of like upper middle class, mostly minority kind of hip hop and fraternity college guys. And you're going to get a very limited line of information from that group. So, this this is annoying in that situation, but it becomes very relevant when people who have fringe niche interests, which are often paraphilias in technical terms as a social scientist, mm -hmm. can find these communities online. Mm -hmm. So like the whole uh, autogynophile thing, this is something that's under discussed in the trans yeah. debate. There's a long recognized male sexual kink. And most men know one person out of 80 that has this that are. It's the idea that not just women are sexy, but there's something hot about being a woman. Mm -hmm. Usually conceived of in this really sort of male dominant way. Like, I like submission and dresses, so I'm a girl. Um, and I think that if you have a forum called AGP Talk, you're going to get more and more people discussing exactly what they like and looking at modern law and concluding, well, I might be female, in fact, and so on down the line. And this is true for virtually every niche interest. Like, there were no furries prior to, like, 1995. Like, there was no... I'm sure there were, like, a couple in the corners of raves yeah, and so yeah. on. Like, I mean, I've seen <laughs> one or two with their, like, homemade ears and shit. Yes. But, like, the idea that you could... Your sexual kink is having doggy-style sex while dressed up as an animal. And you could just talk to most people about this. Uh, nah, son. I mean, like, that would not... I can't, ima I can't imagine telling a girlfriend this. Like, yeah, I love what we do, but would you mind if I dressed up like a wolf? Uh, you know, it's just some would say yes, some would say no, some would say get out of here now. But if there's if there's an entire website where you can log in for a buck yeah. or so and you can talk about this and but you you're, can learn you're, how to make your You're telling yeah, us you, obviously you can you can get the numbers for this because I, I think what we need is data. We need numbers of how many furries, how many go autogonal fields, how many detransitioners, and also what is the race? Like what you know, how many are white, how many are upper class? They're all white. <laughs> Are they? The furries. <laughs> no. Well, different groups have different pathologies. So like the black crime rate right now, like we're a younger, more working class community. Like there, there's a whole culture around selling Coke, the GDs and the vice lords. So the black crime rate is like 2.4 times the white rate. But the white rate of insanity is much higher. <laughs> and again, like I don't I don't find much purpose in engaging in this. Like, yeah, we might shoot people, but you guys are crazy. You know? Yeah. I think it's very interesting, like, I mean, though. No, I, the, I want the to know. <laughs> Yeah, well, so do I. Like, is yeah, yeah, but you know, is your partner more likely to be violent or nuts? Like, they're real questions. But the the actual conversations around this in the academic press are are fascinating. Like, right now, I believe it's forty six percent of young white women are mentally ill. That could just be liberal white women, but forty six percent of white females under a certain pretty high age, I think it's wow. thirty five, have been diagnosed with a serious drug treatable mental illness. So I actually found that out when I used to race debate. It was like, oh, what can I throw back at the crime stats? But then yeah. I started thinking about that. It was like, yeah. well, that's a very serious problem. Yeah. Has anything been done about this? Wow. Like, why is this 
deep depression and so on have generally been more common among men. Why are we now seeing this among women? You know, so there, there's a real issue there. A white and what's so high achieving up? teenagers, white women, yeah. white mm-hmm. high achieving female teenagers, they are really in kind of, if you were to do an analysis, mental health in them, it's huge. Oliver James did it over in England. He did an analysis of it. It's, it's phenomenal. And, I, and I'm also yeah, sure no. that there's a whole group of people who would hear that and say, well, actually, young black teenagers are underrepresented here because nobody cares about their mental health and nobody is trying to screen them. So it's interesting because there's there's no way to actually aim for like a redemptive direction. It's almost like the fastest race to the bottom that is happening, which is really t- troubling. Mm-hmm. Um even when you're trying to kind of say something positive, like, well, in our community, at least we don't have this mental health. It's like, well, we do, but actually nobody cares. That's why it's not being identified. Um, and I would yeah, guess I, that the furries are mostly autistic. So I bet there's all kinds of cross-racial uh, autistic furries if I was to just take a wild guess about it. <laughs> yeah. So for me, something that I find irritating about the black community, just like there are things I find irritating about all other communities, is the desire of a lot of black activists to always be worse than everything. Yeah. Like, I, I mean, I, I think that when you look at poor whites versus poor blacks, there's still a higher rate of mental illness. I don't think it's genetic, but I do think it comes from I- extreme parental exposure of kids to the mental health system when mm-hmm. it's not needed. I mean, middle class black parents will certainly take their ki- children if they're actually acting crazy. Mm-hmm. Um it comes from a lot of other things. There's more extreme internet exposure. So people, young Caucasian friends of mine, or Caucasian friends of mine have described when they were young, going into forums from yes. actual WebMD type stuff to deviant art yep. to like sex chat groups and like deciding they were crazy or they had this perverse interest because they wanted to do something once or twice. And I... I think that's the cause of the mental health disparity. I, I don't actually think that there's less attention paid yeah. to black people in the USA right now. Okay. Like there's almost a frenzied interest in the USA right now in black people. Yeah. So like most, <sighs> I mean, there, there are multiple, yeah, to the point where it's kind of crazy, like mm. approaching insane worship. Mm-hmm. Um, but I mean, there, there are multiple studies where people have looked at uh, mental health outcomes for black teens pretty obviously with the goal of describing them as worse than they are. And they, they really haven't found uh, much there. So, yeah, it seems to be a problem for middle class, mostly white kids. Um, But it's again, the issue with a lot of this stuff is not only is a lot of stuff that's strictly adult, like, you know, video games based around killing people or hardcore Mm -hmm. pornography available when you're like 12. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I I do think that's an issue. But also Mm -hmm. the we talked about like the trans pipeline, for example, like many of the things you could develop an interest in would have actual results. Like, if you tell a doctor that you're transgender as a young male, there actually is a set of surgeries that can theoretically end with you being castrated. So I I would worry about this, and I would say, well, that's a pathology over here. But, you know, as leaders and so on, we should work to fix it. Yeah. Yeah. This is a good place to make our shift. So one of the things we're going to ask you about when we wrap up this portion is how do you talk about these issues outside of publications, outside of academics, outside of podcasts like this? with people in your real life so that you can maybe, you know, ask thought provoking questions, uh, things like that. Before we jump over there, are there any other things aside from, of course, your book and we'll include your social media, any anywhere else you'd like our listeners to go to find more information about you? Uh, well, the, the easiest way to find information about me is really just to Google me. Uh, I'm Wilfred Riley, W I L F R E D R E I L L Y. And if you do that, you'll find my Twitter, my old Facebook, uh, my link to the university website, that kind of thing. So that that's probably the best way to uh, to reach out. Are your Thanks, listing Wilson. stats other, on Google and Twitter and all that stuff? Yeah, yeah. I, <laughs> I should probably like <laughs> the interesting thing about the accessibility of social media is that if I were to do that, like they would immediately pop up as mm-hmm. Google results. So people could talk about whether I was strong or weak and like bookmark the tweet. Like there's nothing that vanishes uh-huh. on the Internet. No. I remember one of the uh, the first OnlyFans superstars was recently surprised to Google herself and find that it was just hundreds of these naked pictures because her assumption had been that none of her followers would like semi ethically download them and save <laughs> oh them. But in God. fact, dozens of people had and they had posted them on, you know, Facebook and so on and other sites that aren't Twitter. You have to log in to ask someone to remove them. So, I mean, like the Internet is very permanent, something I, I tell young people in classes and so on. Yeah. Uh, but hopefully most of my stuff is more more positive as of right now. 
Well, p- thanks a million, Wilfred. That was fascinating. And I'm looking forward to how you're going to tell our, our um, exclusive content about how to talk about gender in, in, in real life, because it's hard. It really is. Yeah. Definitely. Thanks for joining us this week on Gender, A Wider Lens. Listener support means a lot to us. If you enjoy the show, please like and subscribe on iTunes and leave a review. For more information, visit widerlenspod.com. There you'll learn about joining our listener community, how to contribute to our show, and where to find us on social media. Our discussions are for educational purposes and are not intended as a substitute for mental health services.